Hello, everybody. Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Hello, you guys. Welcome back. The 90 Day No Talk Experiment. We are here. We are here and doing the things, y'all. It is definitely a tick because I've been sitting here, have not yawned at all. Start opening my mouth to talk, and here they come. You know what? The devil is a lie. I will not be defeated. But we're jumping in. 90 day no talk experiment. Remember my book. This is the one we're studying going over. This is the book. You can find this on Amazon if you are interested. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Glad to see you here. Gonna have a good time. So glad you're here. Yes, yes. And all the things. All right. We're jumping in. We're on day 57, y'all. Sorry, it's 57. Ooh, I got to fix that. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. It's 57. Oh, darn. I fix it. Yes, 57. Um, and the title of tonight's uh, insert or excerpt is called Sunshine. So, I wanted to preface this. I realize as I'm studying and going back through stuff, I'm sharing my stories, right? And I know some people are like, well, I already heard that story, Shakima. You have to tell that story again. Sometimes people have to hear things multiple times in order for them to get it, right? I think I had to tell it multiple times in order to understand where God brought me from, right? And I think every time I go back and retell a story, one of the things I thought about today that you definitely cannot do, you can't over embellish. You can't over embellish because that's the same as lying. And I take lying very seriously. I had sent somebody an email the other day and I gave them the wrong date. And that thing about tore me up. I'm like, Lord have mercy. I don't mean, you know, to give the wrong dates. I just got it off in my brain. I knew it was either the 2018 or 2019, but it ended up, it was really 2019. And I put 2018 in the email. And that's important to me. Because when people are going back, checking your facts, they come like, well, she said this and this wasn't true. And she said this and that wasn't true. So when I go back and tell these stories, I'm really telling them for my benefit to see where God has brought me from, to thank him for bringing me that far. And honestly, to make sure that I have a accurate record of all the things that God has done. We should never forget anything that God has done for us. Never. That's my belief. It's not everybody's. But I do understand that sometimes the stories may not be something that you've ever gone through. Uh, but I do hope each night that you take something, you're able to take one thing away. It may not be everything, but one thing you can take away and use, right? You can take it away. You can use it for, you know, something, something beneficial. Okay. All right. So tonight is called the sunshine. Now, you guys, I'm on spring break this week and I don't sleep in. Every morning I have to still get up and take a lot of the work. But then I'm able to come back home and jump back in the bed because I don't have to be up. I don't have nowhere to go. I don't have no meetings. I don't have to be at a school. I'm straight. Some mornings I get to school at 630 because I am so early in the morning. It just depends on the morning. But I don't have anything else to do. So I came back home this morning and laid down. Lay down, rolled over, woke back up. It was 730. That's like an extra hour and some more. I was like, nope, I'm not getting up. My body just didn't want to get up. We've been working in the garden doing stuff. I didn't want to get up. So roll back over. And the next time my eyeballs opened, it was 8.30. Now, yesterday, it rained here really bad. We were driving down um, to the other end of the county to see if Alana could get a driving test, but we didn't end up getting a driving test. Like in North Carolina, they don't want no, no new drivers. They good. They don't want no new drivers. So, um, but we were driving and we ran into this storm and it was a whiteout. You could not see anything in front of you. And um, then we got back home. It was overcast. It was all the things. And it had been like this for a couple of days, the overcastness. Well, this morning, I opened my eyes at 839 this morning. 
because I'm going to drag myself out of bed because I could have stayed in bed all day and just lived my best. I'm in bed life. But I rolled over and through my windows, there was the brightest sunshine. I don't know that I've seen sunshine like this in a long time. And it reminded me of today's lesson. And it was like, isn't it just like God to bring you back into remembrance of what he's done for you in your life. And today is marked the sunshine. So I do hope that as I go through this and tell this story that you will you know, be able to glean something from it. Okay. One of the strongest beliefs, I'm on page 91. If you're following me in the book, I'm just going to read out of the book and then I'll expand or expound. One of my greatest beliefs is that if you share your story, if you tell it, right? Then no one else can use it against you later. They can't be pulling up stuff and being like, well, did y'all know? Yes, I told it. So it wasn't anything that anybody had to find. You ain't got to dig and find no dirt on me. I'm just going to tell you all my stuff. And that's just how it's going to be. Don't give people ammunition against you, right? Some things we do tell, some things are not supposed to be told. But whatever my story is, it's mine. It's what I lived through. It's what I experienced. Then nobody else can take that away from me. Good, bad, and different. It is what it is. So as the Lord has allowed me, I have shared a little of what myself and the children are comfortable sharing. Here's a little more of that story now. For as long as I can remember, I have wanted to be a wife and a mother. I was raised to be a wife. My grand planned it that way. I'm a teacher because someone else saw something in me that I couldn't see within myself, took an interest in my future, then helped me achieve the goals I set for myself. As a little girl, I'd always taught something to somebody, but I never knew that there were teachers. When I get dressed in the morning to go to school, I realize that there are little brown girls. There are probably little girls that don't look anything like me as well, but I'm just going from my demographic of students and the people I know who might have a few more issues than others. There are some brown girls who never have thought about them being a teacher. They've never thought about a professional job. They've never seen a professional in their family. This is just the way it is. For, you know, what they know is what they know. I live in a rural place. So it is, is um, I work at one school that's highly disadvantaged, highly Title I, lots of, you know, free reduced lunch. Well, everybody gets free lunch now. But, you know, before we were doing the COVID stuff, a lot of free and reduced lunch is just a lot. So I dress extra nice when I go to school because I want my girls to see a classy woman. I want my girls to be able to see even even, you know, the little fellas to see what a oh, nice woman should be dressed like and look like and respect myself. Had a little girl come up to me the other day. She said, Miss Wilson, I'm I'm doing good and I'm, I'm going to go. She's like, I'm going further. And it's all because of you. And I was like, oh, my, we don't ever think about that because we take it for granted the the influence that we have in the lives of other people. I rarely speak to this little girl. I mean, she doesn't talk out. Right. So you always speak into the ones who talk and you like sit down. Stop. You know, what's your question? You know, if you ask a question, the same kids that answer, answer. She never raises her hand. She never hardly speaks out. But I didn't realize that she was looking at me as an example. Just as some of you are looking at me as an example, just like I look at other people as an example. And so, again, I share the story so that you're able to see just how God has brought me through. Maybe your process is a little bit different than mine. But look at God um, uh, even even using my story. So imagine my great happiness because I was happy. When I found the man of my dreams, got married and had children. Oh, the joy. Finally, 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 my dream had come true or had it right. Because your dream may not be somebody else's dream. You got to go back and, and you, you got to have these questions. You before you start getting entangled, we know about these entanglements before you start getting entangled and definitely before you commit to a covenant relationship through marriage, but in the sight of God and these witnesses, before you do any of that, you better ask all the questions. If you don't know which questions to ask, go to Creflo Dollar's website or his Instagram. And he got a couple of reels up there about all the questions you need to ask, because it is some stuff out here. Because think about this. I'm realizing my dream. This wasn't everybody's dream. Everybody on here don't want to be married. Some of y'all don't want to be married again. 
Some of y'all don't want to have children. Some of y'all can't have children. Children just ain't in the cards for you. Some of y'all don't want to live in the South. Some of y'all don't want to live in the North. I mean, just whatever your story is, realize that's not everybody else's story. So what you have to do and what I have to do is I got to ask enough questions. So before I partner again, I can make sure that the partner that I'm getting with is on the same page as me because I was confused in the beginning. 18 years and three children later, I felt more like I was living in a nightmare than my dream. I had dreamed about being a wife. I had dreamed about being a helpmate. But the problem is, here's my problem. And again, this is my vulnerability and it's my story. I didn't necessarily know how to be an adequate wife. I saw my grandparents argue every day. And when my, my ex-husband didn't argue with me, I thought something was wrong with him. I was like, well, don't you know how this works? We supposed to argue about stuff. He would not argue with me. It was not, not going to happen. So I saw dysfunction and I was trying to recreate the dysfunction. So I'll never sit in the place of anybody and tell them that he was all wrong and I was all right. I had my own faults, but I felt like I was not quite living this dream that I had made it up in my mind to be. I saw a reel today in this lady. She was from another country because you could tell she had an accent. She said, lady, seduce your husband. And I think about some types of things because those of us who were raised in the church, that is not a thing. You do not be enticing no man, but it's yours. It's your man. Why can you not entice? Yes. Yes, you do. Put on all the nighty things, but we're not taught those types of things. And so here you are finding yourself in this place, in this, in this place you always wanted to be in, but not knowing how to navigate it effectively. And you got to learn some stuff. And when I learned the right things, sadly for me, in my case, it was too late. However, it's not too late for this next season that I'm praying for. As every story has two sides, I only tell mine. I'm sure the other side might not see it or tell it the same, tell the same story that I will. I will try to remain a person of integrity and not dishonor that union. It is one that I loved for a very long time. I was, I loved being married. I still love it now and I'm not married. I love marriage. It's my portion. It's what's supposed to be happening for me. Can't tell you about anybody else. But what I learned in the time that I've been separated and divorced is what a good wife looks like, what a help me looks like. And I've also learned flexibility because what one spouse may need, another may not. Again, I had to tell a friend of mine, she's like, I just don't know what I would get married. Why would I need a man? But you're relegating him to gas and uh, gas and grass. He needs to cut the grass and put gas in your car. Those are things I can do for myself. What I need a man for is to be the spiritual heading of this household. I need a priest over this home. I need somebody to lay hands on me and pray. I need somebody to speak destiny into my children. I need to be able to sit at your feet and you can teach me stuff I don't know. That's what I need. So again, when you're out here looking, you better look for the things that you need. Because Mr. Jerome cuts cuts the grass for a small not for a small fee, he will come and cut the grass. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't need a man just for those physical manual labor things. We're past that. I'm beyond that. I'm close to fifty. I've been doing all these things all my life, but I need you for the other pieces of this missing puzzle. Okay. How does someone like me, a wife, a mother, married to the man of her dreams, find herself in the position I'd found myself in? See, 18 years, three children, well, four children later, because I had my daughter at the time, I found myself all alone. I was married single, if that makes any sense. I was married to a man who lived in the bedroom while the kids and I lived in the main house. We were out there doing all, I did all the meals. We did all the cleaning. We did all the stuff but he found himself living in the bedroom. He was happy by himself. He was happy playing his video games. He was just happy doing his own thing that didn't include us. Now, when we went outside the house, he needed to have the perfect show family because we had to make people think we were the perfect family, even though we weren't. Alone without a husband, the person I pledged my life to before God, I'll be honest with you and say this. I have loved God my whole life. I have always loved God. Don't know when it started. Don't plan for it to stop. But I've always had a love for the Lord. Even when I didn't know him exactly like that, like I said, you know, in several other um, teachings, some of us know who he is, but we do not know him. We have no 
um, personal knowledge of him at all. We've never seen him at work. We've never seen his hand move on our behalf. We've never seen him step into a situation or a circumstance. We've never, we just don't have any active memory of God. And I don't know a time when I was without God. I just am somewhere in my spirit, my heart of hearts. I've always known he was there. He has been with me even when I wasn't with him. Ain't that like like somebody? Don't you want that person? Yes. And I always look at if you look at marriage and then you look at your relationship with God, doesn't um, it, it? If the church is the if the church is the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. It always um, gives us that parallel, right? So I look at marriage just like I would look at the Lord. Like this is a thing that I'm supposed to be doing. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. What else would I be doing but serving God? Um, but this predicament had me questioning this new place in my life. This wasn't the life I uh, it was supposed to be. I didn't pray for this. I didn't pray to be single. I didn't pray to have a newborn. And be walked out on. I didn't pray to not be able to manage my finances. I didn't pray to try to figure out how to make it on one income when we couldn't make it on two. I didn't pray for any of that. But again, what I also didn't know or have any models or examples of is what a real working marriage should be like. Two people pulling together in the same direction. That's why you um, yoke oxen together so that they can go in the same direction. That bar that goes over their back is to keep them focused because I can't turn to the left or the right. I can only go this way. The reins are in the back. And when the farmer slaps the ox, they move, but they move in tandem with each other. If you ever let them start going in their own direction, you're never going to get anything done. And that's where I found myself. It was like, what the heck? I didn't sign up for this, yet I still found myself in a very scary place, a place other women before also found themselves. And here's what I was thinking when I was studying this. I thought I was special, right? This wasn't, surely, this is not going to happen to me. I didn't dress up nice. I mean, I dressed up all the time, but I didn't dress the way he appreciated. I didn't get my hair done. The reason I didn't get my, I mean, I would wear it in a ponytail. I had long hair then. I would wear it in a ponytail. And the reason I didn't get my hair done is because um, brown women have to go to the beauty shop two or three times a month just to keep it straight. And we didn't have the money for that. So I didn't have the money to afford to get my hair done. He didn't like me in makeup. I didn't wear makeup. I didn't know I was supposed to wear makeup. I didn't wear makeup till I was 23 years old. Had never worn it before in my life. A little lipstick here, but that was about it. No foundation, no highlights, no all, no false lashes. Now, what you see here now is all natural. I just have on this little lip color. And Instagram, I do have a little filter on just to smooth out the skin. But this is all Shakima, right? But I didn't know that that was a thing I was supposed to do. But I never thought this would happen to me. Breakups happen to other people. Divorces happen to other people. I never got married thinking I would get a divorce. I never got married and wanted to have children thinking I would be a single parent. I just never, it never crossed my mind. My grandparents were married to each other until my grandfather passed away. 50 years they were married. 50 years. And my grandmother missed my grandfather so much that it, she died a year later. I don't even know if she made it a year. It might have been just right at a year. But she she couldn't live without my grandfather. That was her person for 50 years. Oh, my goodness. I hate that for you, Miss Lisa. But here's the thing, right? Exodus 20, if you got your Bible, go to Exodus chapter 20, verses 3, 4, and 5. Do not have other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourselves, whether in the shape of anything in the heaven above or on earth below or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's sin to the third and the fourth generation to those who hate me. Now, here's the thing. If I go just to 5A, just that part, marriage to me was an idol. It was an idol. It was a thing to, to um, uh, chase after, to achieve. And then that was it. I didn't know what else to do after I got married. I didn't know how to stay married. I didn't know how to work the marriage. I didn't know how to, um, um, what, what, what do I want to say? I didn't know how to meet the needs of my spouse. 
Because had I known, I probably didn't even know the needs he had. Had I known some of the needs he had that I was unwilling to give, then I probably would have not been married. I would have just let that go. But when I got married, it was like, okay, I'm married. And I had, I, that was the prize. The prize was the marriage. But I didn't realize that in order for the marriage to remain, I had to do something on my part. From the very beginning, I should have known something was amiss. See, in the above verses, the Lord was clear. No other gods. And on that point, I had failed. I had failed miserably. My, my husband, that man I was married to, was my, um, he was like my heir. His very presence was needed just to justify my life. Now, again, I'm sharing my, my stuff. This may not be for you, but I did not think that I was worth worth anything without him. He gave me value. I found my value in being his wife. I didn't have value in Shakima. That's why when a, a lot of people look at me now, they think I'm kind of being funny because I am taking time to focus on me, on me growing myself, uh, working on my weight, working on my, you know, my makeup skills, working on all the things feminine, working on all the things beauty, working on all the clothing brand uh, deals that I get. A lot of people like, oh, she's just being funny. No, I'm just catching up. I'm making up for lost time. I'm making up for the time I didn't spend doing these things years and years ago when I was raising children. Remember, I had my daughter at 14. I had my daughter at 14 years old, got pregnant at 13, had been being abused since I was five. I could have been older. I mean, I could have been younger pregnant, but thank God the Lord let me wait. Got my cycle very early. And when people start touching you and carrying on, what do you do? Right? So I felt very worthless. I didn't feel like I was worth anything to anybody. I was worth something as long as you were using me. But after that, right, I didn't feel like anything. So when I found this man, I found all of my worth in him. All of my worth was in him, not just a little fraction. All of my worth was in him. Well, at the stage I am now, because the Lord has brought me through and he's helped me process, I, I am worthy of his love, which is I, if you don't love me, he loves me. So, I mean, I'm on a whole nother level now. But back then I, I was in a bad way. I loved everything about him, the good, the bad and the ugly. He could do no wrong in my eyes. A girl from nowhere in North Carolina, I was worthless. And I knew it. I, nobody had to tell me. You didn't have to tell me I was worthless. I already knew that for myself. I had grown up knowing it. My parents didn't want me. My grandparents took me. But I was in a home with three other girls who at any given moment, depending on whatever the case was, I was, my, my father's half Puerto Rican. I'm half Puerto Rican. So I had different hair. I had a different length of hair. I was a little bit lighter skinned. So that puts you out. People don't love you. And it was like, oh man, this is my life. And it really was. So you didn't have to tell me I was worthless. I already knew. I, I knew all that. I'm from nowhere, North Carolina. To even be with somebody of his qualities had me awestruck. I was like, oh, wow. How, why would he pick me? He told me the first night that he saw me, we were at a basketball game and I was walking in to the basketball game. He was sitting in the bleachers. I didn't even know who he was. And I was walking into the basketball game. Or maybe I was sitting on the bleachers and he was walking in. And he said to me, you look like you should be with me. I was like, well, darn. Okay. I don't know what that means. But I, I mean, maybe I didn't look like I should have been with anybody else. But okay. Um, I further, I was further convinced because of my past that no one else would, uh, neither want nor accept me because of the abuse. Nobody would want somebody that was used up goods. Again, nobody had to tell me I was used goods. I knew that I knew. So when he said he wanted me, I was all in, all in. Imagine my absolute horror when one day about four months after Jackson was born, he walked out on us. Wait, what? <laughs> what? Why? What did I do wrong? That was my first question. What did I do wrong? I never thought about what did he do wrong? And not wrong in like doing something to hurt me, but in the very beginning, 18 years ago, what, what conversation did we not have? 
What conversation did we not, what did we not sit down and hash all the way out? So 18 years later, when something came up, we would be on the same page. What, com what form of communication did we not put in? So we just totally ignored all the bad stuff all the time. And then when you got too overwhelmed, when it got over your head, you didn't know how to process it anymore. So the only thing you knew how to do was leave. Remember, I didn't get to leave because everybody was like, he had to go. Well, nobody asked me if I wanted to go. I, I could have packed a bag real quick, but who would have who would have kept the children? Because remember, he left us. He didn't left me. He didn't leave me. He left everybody. So we got to process those things. Well, when you want to leave, what about I want to go too? So we need to make arrangements for the children because if you go and I'm going, I'm not going to be stuck. And I never processed any of that. We never talked about it. But my first question was, what did I do wrong? The answer to this last question could be its own entry. Honey, it could be a whole nother book. So we'll just move on. Needless to say, my heart felt complete, completely ripped out. Looking back on it now, there were warning signs. I knew God. I knew his word. Exodus 23 through 5 was very clear. It wasn't new to me. I already knew that. The Ten Commandments. I was just blind to it because, again, as I said before, this wasn't supposed to happen to Shakima. This was supposed to happen to everybody else but me. I was going to get this thing right. I met, I was married. Yes, I was. And I wasn't getting divorced. I filed for divorce. It wasn't him. He would have stayed married forever. Me? No, ma'am. Mm -mm. Okay. I wanted what I wanted when I wanted. When he left, I was lost. Remember, he was my everything. When he left, I didn't know how to function. I was like, Lord, what am I supposed to do now? I was, But I was determined to let him go. I told him, I said, if being without us is better for you, then you go. I said it. I had this conversation. Yes, I did. Nobody can tell you I didn't because I did. I said, I love you enough to let you be happy, even though I was dying inside. I was at my wit's end. I didn't know how I was going to focus. And we get into the sunshine part. Don't worry, y'all. I'm not going to leave y'all out there. And here's the thing. When he walked out the door, I had a secret weapon. Now, I didn't have physical weaponry, but I knew that I could call on Lord, the Lord and God would be there for me. Even in the times when I didn't call on him, he was still right there. And had I said his name in those moments, Jesus would have shown up for me. So I was very, very sure that Jesus was there, right? I don't, I didn't have another man somewhere. I didn't have a sneaky link. I didn't have nobody. No, I, there was no phone call person I could call because another person, even if I had gotten another man, then it would not have fixed me. It wouldn't have fixed the problem. I would have just taken my problems and given them to somebody else for him to be jacked up. And to look at me jacked up. So it wasn't any of that. What it ended up being was I needed to call on the Lord because he was the only person then and now still who could get me out of the place that I was in. I was in despair. I was so far down. I didn't know if I was ever going to get back up. But the, you know, the Bible says a just man fall down yay, seven times, but he gets back up. We fall down, but we get up. I, I didn't know how to get up. I was face planted. I was out. I held it together just long enough for him to close the door softly behind him. And after that, I was crying. The kids was crying. Everybody crying. I'm like, Lord, what in the world? What is this Jesus exactly? Romans 10, 9 and 10 was my answer or one of them anyway. It wasn't that I wasn't saved. I have all, I've been saved since I was 13 years old. I made a, a further decision for the Lord in 1999. And I've stayed with my decision since 1999. Doesn't mean I haven't had to go back and renew and dedicate. I just renew and dedicate just so I'm in. Just make sure I didn't miss nothing. But me and the, me and the Lord are locked in. We locked in. Before I called on Jesus, I had to know him like Adam knew Eve in a very intimate space. And I think that's the part that I've been trying to drive home these last couple of, of nights. Some of us know who he is, but we don't know him. Know is an intimate term. That is genosco in the, I think it's the Greek or the Hebrew, don't get me wrong, with one of them. 
but it's to know them intimately. That means you get to go into the bed chamber. You get to lay down with the lover of your soul and he gets to know you in all the intimate spaces and places. That's what that word means. So for those of you husbands and wives that are married, when you go in and you do a little rubbing and carrying on, the next thing you know, you is entangled that kind of way. And I wasn't sure at that moment that I knew him like that. I knew him, but I didn't really know him like that. And so what I needed to do was I needed to get into that place because it was only in that place where I found safety and security, where I felt I found rest and peace, where I found calm, where I just I I didn't have chaos and all this mind stuff happening to me. That was the only place that I was going to be able to be delivered from myself, from all the things and the bad thoughts. And you should have done this and you could have did this and all the things. I wasn't going to be delivered just with, within my own strength. I had to get into Jesus. Oh, how I knew him. He would go of night or day when I needed some alone us time. This time would be no different. When me and the Lord really solidified our relationship, it was in the, within the first three years of my separation and divorce. In North Carolina, you have to be separated for one year before you can file for divorce. I had to file for divorce twice. One because Once because I got the paper, uh, the notary filled out the wrong date on the paper. And so I had to go back and file again. They would not let it go through. And I had to pay for it twice because, again, he wasn't going to file for divorce ever. But even though I was in that place, I still had to get in good with the Lord because I didn't want to go through this again. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I need you to let me feel everything that I'm feeling, every single thing. I need to feel every pain, every hurt, every wound, every rip, every tear. Because I want to recognize this. If I should get into another situation, I want to recognize these feelings so I can head them off at the pass. When he left, closed the door softly, I cried. And I cried every night for 365 nights straight. Every single night. Remember, I told y'all we lived, we slept in a twin, uh, king size bed, a queen size bed. I had to get rid of that. I wasn't going to have the memories. And I'm rolling over looking for you and you ain't there. I, I went down to a twin, slept on a twin bed for seven years. I just wasn't going to do that to myself. For the first year, he would come down and stay with the kids and I would go stay with my sister. I would let him stay at my house because he didn't have any other place to go and be with the kids. And I wanted him to be with his children. But I'm still processing this. What did I do wrong? What did I say wrong? What did I not? You know, it's too late then. You got to work that marriage the whole time you marry. You can't be trying to work it out after they leave. You know, you better be working this whole thing before they go. 365 days, I cried. Cried my eyes out for all the things that would never be, for all the lost opportunities, for those lost Adam and Eve moments that would never happen again, and for my children who were losing their father because of me. Had to be my fault. They didn't do anything to him. It was me. Now, will I take 100% credit for the loss? I won't because we both were entered into this covenant marriage. And whatever I didn't do, there were some things that you didn't do. And so how did we get to this place? But again, because I felt so worthless, I knew it was me. And it was only spending time with the Lord, like for real time with the Lord, sitting in my prayer chair, earbuds in, worship music on, crying out at the top of my lungs. My kids would fall asleep with me in here, hollering and screaming to God, just really crying out to the Lord. Just like David. David said, I cried out to the Lord and he heard me. I was crying. I still do it now. My kids and the dogs just sleep through it. They like, Lord, she at it again. We just going to be asleep. But here's the thing, right? 365 days I cried and it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, Let me see. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't leave my house unless I was going to work or church. Other than that, I would get to the front door. I would open the door and I could not put my foot outside the door. He had been my world. 
And I don't think we should make anybody our world. I do think we should esteem our spouse higher than ourselves, just like we would our neighbor. But you can't be my world because when you're not there anymore, what, what, what does my world consist of now? God, Jesus, he is my world. Thou shall have no other gods before me. I don't care who it is. Again, a crazy man said to me, you're not going to find a man that's going to be second to anybody, including God. I said, yes, I will, because I'm going to be second for him, including God. Yeah, I will. He's going to be second in my life and I'm going to be second in his life. And we're going to understand that if God is first, then we 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 next with each other. But there will there will be no other gods at all. You you get to control that, Shakima. I was like, man, so to do it wrong again is going to be on me. Not if, if I'm going to do it right the next time based on what I've been through this last time. I felt like my my um home was falling in around me not because there was structural damage but he handled all the things all the bills all the insurance all the groceries i mean he didn't even let me go to the grocery store because he said i spent too much money at the grocery store so he wouldn't let me go because we didn't have the money to spend but now i was going to have to have all of these things it was going to be all on me everything and we were struggling with two incomes lord how am i going to make it work on one how what are you going to do see it wasn't like i had to ask those questions but then it was like lord what are you going to do how are you going to help me cuz you're the only help that i have right now i don't have any family where i am i was contemplating going back home cuz we moved here we knew nobody my church family, my pastor called me one day. He said, Shakima, what do you want to do? If you want to stay, we'll help you stay. If you want to go, we'll help you move. Whatever you want to do. And I said, I'll stay. I didn't want to move my kids one more time. We had moved and moved and moved and moved. And we we could, we didn't have, we felt like Jesus. He had nowhere to rest his head, child. We just kept moving. I'm like, no, I'm not moving again. I'm staying where I am. This is where I am. And I'm going to, I'm going to walk this thing out with the Lord and all will be well. Um, so when I asked the Lord, I said, let me feel it all. Y'all, I felt it all. I felt every anger. I felt disappointment. I felt rage. I felt bitter. I felt like I wanted to hurt people. You name it. I felt it every Sunday. I laid on the altar. Just cry. I cried for three years, just on the altar, just on the altar every Sunday at church. I just had to stay there until me and the Lord had dealt with some stuff. Until he had shown me all of the things in Shakima that were just ugly, that I needed to fix, that I needed to, that I needed to submit to him, I needed to surrender control, and I needed to allow him to fix it in me, right? I couldn't fix it. That's the thing for some of us. We're out here trying to fix ourselves. You can't fix you, because if you could fix you, you would have been fixed by now. So what you have to do is lay it all down at his feet, surrender it to him, and give him permission to work within you to work in this situation, to work throughout whatever it is that you're going through. God, I'm giving it to you. I don't know how to deal with it because if I did, I'd have fixed it by now. So I'm putting it right here for you. Do what you're going to do, homie, because I don't know how to fix it. 18 years of my life were gone in a matter of three minutes. I wondered if I would ever feel normal again, and still I cried. 365 days. On the 366th day, this is where we get to the sunshine part. I was in my small two-bedroom apartment cooking in the kitchen, feeling like death warmed over because I'd cried myself to sleep again the night before. Feeling like death warmed over over what had just happened, and this was a year ago. It, wasn't, it, it didn't just happen. It was a whole 365 days later because I'm on 366 now, and I counted every last one of them. As it happened, directly across, so I'm in my kitchen, so imagine I'm in the kitchen, but directly across from me is a small little dining area where we had our table and chairs, but the living room was right across directly. And there were two large windows in that living room. And I remember I was standing at the stove facing the wall. I'm cooking the little meal. When I go back into that little apartment these days, I'm like, oh, my God, how did I fit all those kids in here? It's tiny. But to us, it felt like it was luxury. I'm being real honest, y'all. My rent was so affordable, economical. Ooh, it worked out. But 
but I'm fix, I'm cooking the eggs or whatever it is I'm cooking. I turn around to fix the plates because I had to fix the plates on the on the bar area because there was no room on the back side. And in the windows, I saw this bright sunshine, just like I did this morning when I woke up. And I was like, wow. Oh, my God. Streaming in the window was the most brilliant sunlight I had ever seen in that same moment. It was in that moment, not before. That same moment, not before. I knew one thing. God loved me no matter what. God loved me no matter what. God loved me no matter who was with me or who left me. God loved me no matter what I was going through. God loved me no matter what I was in who I was sleeping with, what I, what kind of addictions I had, what kind of beverages I had. God loved me no matter what. So I'm telling you this. He, If he loved me in that magnitude, how much greater does he love you? The same. He loves you just the same. And all your stuff, all your anger, all your business, all your disappointment, all your disillusionment, all of that, none of that is going to keep him from loving you. It didn't keep him from loving me. And I wasn't even just mad. I was angry. Remember at three years, at the three year mark, I asked the Lord, pray for it. I said, Lord, would you please run him over with a bus? And I meant it. I meant that thing. So three years later, I was still praying. Thank God the Lord has delivered me from all of that. But y'all, I was in a way. I was in a way. He loved me no matter what. He was going to be with me through it all. It didn't matter who left. He never will. And he never would. He told me. I'm with you, Shakima. That sunlight, that sunshine that came through that window, just like it was this morning. It was the brightest sunshine that I have seen. I've been in this house almost eight years. And when I and I, I got up and it just illuminated the whole room, I was like, oh my God, what are you trying to say to us, Lord? He's like, I'm with you. I'm never going anywhere. Everybody could leave, but I'm still going to be here. And I had to take that. Even even there were days when I might not have believed that. Today, I believed it. And you know what happened? I didn't cry over that relationship again. 365 days is all you about to get from this, bro. Listen, 366 and moving forward now, what? 14 years later, I'm not crying over that. Not over him and me. I do sometimes think about the children, but they're old enough now that they have their own relationship. It is not predicated on anything that he and I do together. But I'm not crying over that. From that day to this, 15 years later, 14, 15 years later, I haven't cried over him again. I've shed tears for my kids, but not over him. That sunlight was my sign from God that all would be well for me and my children. God is not a man that he should lie and he never has. Again, don't stretch them truths. If God don't lie, you don't lie. Everybody lies. No, everybody don't. Don't you let nobody lie to you and tell you that you got the lie. You do not. Tell the truth. Be It's going to be what it is. Whatever the chips fall, okay, let them fall. Whatever the consequences are from your truth, it is the truth. That's what you're getting from me because I'm not about to lie. God don't lie to me and I'm not finna lie to you. I would love to say that I was totally healed after that sunshine, but that would be a lie. It still took me time. Remember on that third year, big yellow bus. But after that, and I had to work through, some people are healed instantly and some people have to walk through. I saw my grandmother get instantly healed from alcohol, instantly. She had drank probably 60 years. She had to drink in the morning just to function. But when the Lord touched her, she was healed immediately. My grandfather, who had drank just as much, had to go through withdrawals. He went through the DTs, but his wife stopped drinking, he stopped drinking. He, he just wasn't going, he said, mm -mm, my wife not doing it no more. I'm not doing it no more. And they were sober together. The last 10 years of their marriage, they were sober together. I can tell you that since then, after about six years, everything was amazing. So it was like six years after that, life was amazing. Life is amazing. God is my light and the love and my love forever. I love the Lord and God loves me. And no matter what I did back then, he's not holding that against me. That was my human self. And there may be disappointments that come, you know, come again. It's human to feel an emotion. The Bible tells us, we, we read it, you can be angry, but don't sin. So I might feel a type of way, but I'm not going to sin against you, against anybody, and mainly sin against the Lord. 
So don't think just because you're going through something that God is not there. Where is he going? Now, if you're not saved and you don't know him as Lord and Savior, he ain't there. But he stands at the door and knocks. All you got to do is let him in. So as I do every night, I want to ask you, do you know him? Yes or no? You get to make that choice and that decision. If you don't, let me recommend that you set up a date and a time to do so. Get to know the lover of your soul. Yes, ma'am, I will. But see, here's the thing. Feeling the uh, comment came in, will you pray for me? I'm asking you to pray for me. I just feel so much stress. That's a choice. You don't have to feel it. Situations are what they are. Write it down, take note, then ask the Lord, how do you want me to handle this? How are you going to take care of this? Your word says, if I give, it shall be given unto me. Good measure, press down, shaken together, running over. Shall you cause men to give unto my bosom? I have given to you. Now my bosom over here is a little empty. So can you fill it up? However it is that you, whatever you want to do, God. See, we, we don't take on. Again, remember the other night I said there is no struggle in the Lord. It's, we don't struggle in the Lord. Struggle is personal choice. That doesn't mean we don't have situations and circumstances because we do. Everybody going to have something. But I am choosing to lay that all at the feet of Jesus and allow him to come in and do what he wants to do. God, you can take all of this. He said, come to me all who are, who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. If we are weary, we should be giving all of that over to him. He said, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you're walking around with all that pressure and stress, it's because there has not been an exchange on our part. I got to give my stuff to him. You take care of it and then trust him to take care of it. Do your part. Do my part, Shakima. And then allow the Lord to do what the Lord is going to do. Because God going to God every time. He going to God every time. But that's that relationalness. I only know him as Jehovah Rapha when I'm sick. I know him as Shalom when I am feeling at dis-ease. I know him as Nisi when I need him to be my band. I know him. You got to know who he is. In my situation. God, at this moment, I'm feeling something that ain't quite right. I'm going to need you to, you know, direct me, lead me, guide me, show me. And that's all of us. So I'm just sharing that with all of us, right? Because it can be very easy to revert back to old behavior, which means we take on the, the burdens of the world. And it's not, it's not, my daughter works with this, with this one particular individual. And every day they stressed out. Why are you coming here if you stressed out? You, you just, you making it bad for everybody else with your stress. We do not want to hear. I have a friend, her name is Antoinette. She says, um, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. Put it in the trash. We don't want it. We, we just don't want it. We're good. Thank you so much. No, thank you. And, and that is an okay uh, response. Do you want this stress? No, thank you. Put it in the trash. No, mm-mm. That's right. Cast your cares on the Lord for he cares for you. Cast them on, on him. His shoulders are big enough. The, the Bible says that the government of the world shall be upon his shoulders. It's big enough. If it's big enough to carry the government, it's big enough to carry your little stuff. My little stuff. And again, this seemed like such beyond my thinking at this point. And I was like, Lord, I don't, I, I didn't know where else to turn, but I'm turning to you and you're going to fix this for me. And he fixed it for me. I get that some people are not at that level, but you cannot use that as an excuse for every for every time. You got to get there. We have to get there. Some of us, we just don't want to get there or some of us don't know how. That's why you come here. That's why you go to your place of worship. That's why you go to your community so you can learn how to get there. Because if I kept telling myself, well, I don't know how to get beyond this divorce, I would still be feeling like I felt 15 years ago. But no, the devil is a lie. That's not God's best for me. You got to ask yourself, what is God's best for me? Because I wasn't always at this level either, but it was line upon line, precept upon precept, situation by situation, turning it over to the Lord by turning it over to the Lord, mistake by mistake, falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up. You, it's a process and we should there should be progress in the process. There should be progress in the process here's the thing and i'm done 
Don't give yourself an excuse. Don't. Because if you give yourself one, you're going to give yourself 50. Y'all watch 600 Pound Life? Y'all, don't y'all love uh, Dr. Nas Arden? Dr. Nas Arden don't be playing with him. He said, Dr. Nas Arden said, you eat for two and three people. <laughs> you're 600 a pound. You don't follow the diet. We cannot help you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we keep giving ourselves those excuses. I cannot help you. That's what he says. And as long as we give ourselves an out, we don't have to deal with us. I don't have to deal with me. I don't have to deal with him. I don't have to deal with the situation. I have to deal with the kids. But if you don't deal with it now, you're going to be dealing with it later. And I'd much rather have dealt with it then than when I'm asking God to set me on the right path and put me in the, in the path of my husband than have to be dealing with it when he show up. I don't want to do it. No, ma'am. Not, not me. Now, listen, here's the thing, y'all. Right. I'm just throwing it out here. You take it, chew your meat, spit out the bones, get what you can get from it. Allow, ask God, say, okay, God, with all that she said tonight, what, what can I use? What can I use? <laughs> what can I use? Because everything may not be for everybody. And so I know this, I was thinking about this the other night too. I'm giving y'all 90 straight days. A lot of times you hear a message on Sunday and you have six more days to think about it before you go back on another Sunday. This is a lot of information, but here's the thing. They're on replay. You can go get the replay, right? You can get the replay. So if you don't get it, you can you can go back and get it again. Anywho, there it is. Thank y'all so much for joining me. All the thumbs, all the likes, all the shares. Tomorrow is day 56. We're talking about my desire. My desire is tomorrow, day 56. I already got the date wrong, so I'm going to change that. Day 56. I love you guys. I appreciate you. I'm praying for all y'all. I'm praying for me. Y'all pray my strength, and I'll continue to pray for y'all. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow night. Bye now.